Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. This week, I'm tackling a topic that has long been one of interest for me, and uh, I was just waiting to find the right crew to have this conversation with, and I found them this week. Um, I have joining me a an anesthesia group owner, as well as an employment attorney to talk about non-competes. And there's gonna be some you know, complex and legal conversation happening. Obviously, none of this should be construed as legal advice, and make sure you're talking to a qualified attorney in your own state before you make any decisions that could impact your career. But I have seen that, you know, anesthesiologists have been treated in some cases the same as other specialties when it comes to non-competes. And I don't think that is the most reasonable and logical path forward. So we talk about how non-competes are manifest in the lives of anesthesiologists, how it varies by state, and what it might mean for you if you're thinking about making a switch on your job. So as always, thanks for tuning in. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined today by a couple guests. Dr. Brian Schmutzler, who's now a friend of the show, been on a couple times, and he's connected me with his uh, legal counsel, Barbara Malargic fitch And she's an attorney based in Indiana, where Brian's located, and we're here to talk about some interesting employment law questions that the three of us have run into at different times in our travels. And you may hear in the background, my little guy running around, my wife is post-call, and Calvin is running amok. So, uh, we're going to try to edit out as much of that as possible, but that's what's going on in the Harvey household on a Saturday morning. So guys, thank you for joining today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Specifically, we're going to be talking about non-competes and I know I have my own opinions about <laughs> how these can and should look as a, you know, uh, I would say an unabashed physician advocate wanting doctors to have the best lives possible. Cause I think that translates into the best patient care and patient outcomes possible. So, um, Brian, you know, as you think about non-competes, obviously you've been in many different sort of formats for your career as an employed physician, as a business owner in private practice in academic medicine. Tell me a little bit about how you think about this idea. Uh, well, I, I'll just come out right out and tell you my opinion to begin with. I think for anesthesia providers, uh, non-competes in general are, are not, not really something that should be present. Um, you know, I, I've dealt with them on both ends, as you've said. Um, and I think just in general, when you think about why do we have a non-compete, well, it's a, to protect the business interest. And really, um, anesthesia providers don't have their own patients. Um, so patients come to us from surgeons, from proceduralists. Uh, and so it, I think it would be highly, highly unlikely that any patient would come to a particular facility or to a particular surgeon because of an anesthesiologist. And so my big problem is, is sort of on a fundamental level um, that really it's, it's a restriction uh, of your ability to work without really any background or any fundamental um, background to it. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about, so I've, I've signed non-compete before uh, one, maybe Barb, one non-compete in the past. Um, yeah. and, 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 and since that time, I learned my lesson. Uh, I, don't, I don't sign contracts that have non-competes, um, particularly broad, wide-ranging non-competes. That strikes me as a pretty bold statement. So I'm curious, you know, somebody might say, Brian, that sounds amazing. Like, I would love to have a rule like that. Like, I don't do non-competes. But that sounds like something that uh, could only be a principle for somebody with some negotiating leverage. And maybe if you're geographically constrained, I'm going to be in this city. There's only one game in town, and I got to kind of take what's given. Uh, you know, how do you think about that? Um, yeah, so certainly when you first come out of residency, it's going to be very, very difficult to, to negotiate uh, a contract that doesn't have a non-compete if the, the group or the, the company you're joining has a non-compete built into their standard contract. That being said, um, I, I think, and Barb will touch on this a little bit, I think there's some portions of the non-compete that you can uh, at least negotiate uh, scope, distance, time, that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, I, I'm in a little bit different position than I was when I first came out of residency. Um, you know, I, I, the last few contracts I've signed have been people who have come to me, um, sort of asking for my help, asking for me to help their, their anesthesia programs. And so I, that definitely gives me the leverage to say, I'm not going to sign a non-compete, but I'll tell you on the flip side of that, I'm, I'm not an unfair person. Um, 
the CRNAs that we employ don't have non-competes either. Uh, so if, if a CRNA that works for me wants to go across the street and work at a hospital across the street, they have full reign to do that. Um, the only way we kind of structure our non-competes is within the facility. So what I don't want to happen is for a CRNA to, to uh, kind of learn the practice and then go to whomever the contract is with and undercut me and try to take the contract away. That, that I think is a reasonable, reasonable reason to have a non-compete. But in general, if I'm not treating them well and they want to go across the street, that's, that's, their, uh, that's their prerogative. I feel exactly the same way. And I think that's why we kind of resonate on this is people don't go to XYZ hospital because I want to work with that anesthesiologist. It just doesn't happen in practice. And so from my standpoint, I think having very onerous restrictive non-competes for in for anesthesia, any anesthesia provider or practitioner, it just, it, it doesn't logically make sense because there's no business threat to that person going to the hospital across the street, in my opinion. Now, if there's some circumstance where there's a special systems knowledge or like, some kind of, you know, inside information that's like critical business information. Frankly, I think that's probably covered under like a confidential information clause and not a non-compete. So it, the protection should still be there. But the, the non-compete itself for anesthesia providers, I just, I think it doesn't make sense. And I think that there should be some specialty specific awareness when it comes to non-competes and physician contracts, because you couldn't say the same of an orthopedic surgeon or a spine surgeon, or I'm going to go three states away to go see Dr. Smith because he's renowned in this and that. That happens in some circumstances. And so I think that us, I just think we need to use a, a finer point, <laughs> at least, you know, as we think about this broadly in society and as an employer and as employees, as classes of people to be able to improve the situation for everyone. That's my opinion. Barb, what have you seen in this? In this yeah, realm? absolutely. So first, I want to give my standard disclaimer, because I'm a lawyer and like to give disclaimers. Um, I'm an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Indiana. So I can only give um, specific thoughts as Indiana law. Um, but today, I'm also just going to talk about some general principles related to non-competes. Um, but I always recommend everybody get their own um, lawyer in their specific state to get a formal legal opinion. Um, but overall, some thoughts. Um, Non-compete laws really vary by state. Some states have statutory law. Some states have case law. Some states have both on the subject of non-competes. Um, and they really vary. Some states um, are really anti-non-competes, and you can only have a non-compete in a very limited situation. And some states don't, have, don't like non-competes when it comes to physicians. Um, they see that that is harmful to the public. If a physician, especially a, a, spe a physician who specializes like a surgeon or anesthesiologist, if they have to leave the northern half of the state, that is going to affect the community. They may not be able to get surgeries, you know, in time that could, I mean, that could literally um, cause patients to die because they can't get a surgery in time. Um, other states will enforce a non-compete if it is considered reasonable. And Indiana is one of those states. Um, and so there are several factors that a court looks at in Indiana and some other states to determine whether a non-compete is considered reasonable. And one, and Brian had mentioned um, earlier, is whether the, the restraint of the non-compete is necessary to protect an employer's legitimate business interests. Um, and if it's not, if it's overly broad, then a court might find that to be unreasonable. Um, there's some other factors that the court is going to look at, such as the duration of the non-compete, uh, geographic extent of the non-compete, and the scope of activities. And so just to give you some examples, um, in Indiana, a one or two year time restriction may be seen as reasonable, but in some circumstances, a five to 10 year may not be reasonable. Um, a 25 mile radius non-compete from a physician's location that they practice at might be considered reasonable, but an entire state or, or a nationwide restriction in some situations may be considered unreasonable. So when a physician is looking at these agreements, you really wanna be very, very careful um, to look at the scope of that non-compete. Um, and it also, as you guys had mentioned, it really depends on your negotiating power. If you have no negotiating power, you may not be able to negotiate as much. Whereas if you have lots of negotiating power, you can say what you want in the contract. Um, but physicians right out of med school, they still need to look at that provision carefully and still consider trying to push back. Um, some, some physicians, they, they travel to an area, get a job, and then you set up there. You have a family, you are involved in the community. And if your non-compete is too broad, then if it doesn't work out, you might have to leave the area. 
So you really want to be careful about trying to shrink that non-compete scope as much as possible. Yeah, and this dovetails nicely with a, a bit of advice that I always give, especially if it's your first job out of training, and you're, especially if you're moving across the country to take a job. Understanding the terms of your non-compete goes a long way to have very practical life and financial planning implications for like, should I buy a house? Because if there's four places you can work in a given town and the, the non-compete you sign is very flexible and very reasonable and you can go from practice A to practice B to practice C without leaving town, that's great. And buying a house might be very reasonable if you definitely want to be in that city. But if you're in a place where there's one game in town and the non-compete is 50 miles from any location in this state, then it's like, holy cow, if I quit, I'm going to have to leave the state. And you're better off renting to make sure that that job is going to work out. You know, with regards to the footprint, can you give us some of the things to think about? Because I've seen this look a lot of different ways as far as how big is the actual radius and from which places is the radius being measured? Yeah, really good question. So it's very, very contract specific. When courts are looking at these cases, they are so fact specific because you're looking at the specific language of the contract. You're looking at the specific facts of the case and then applying the law. Um, so I've seen all kinds of different contracts. I've seen two year restrictions, three re year restrictions. I just looked at a contract that was a one year restriction. Um, sometimes it is one county restriction, two county restriction. Sometimes it's a radius. I just, I just read one that was 15 mile radius um, from the a practice site and the practice site was defined as multiple locations. So when you're looking at that before you sign it, you really gotta get a map out you gotta map out all those locations, do a 50 mile radius to really see like what, what that scope looks like to figure out, okay, if this doesn't work out, what are my options at other jobs? Um, and when it's that big, sometimes it can get a little confusing when you, when you wanna try to leave to try to figure out, okay, what, what is the scope here? Um, so trying to like narrowly tailor that scope and make it really clear. So for example, if you say, 15 mile radius from my practice site located at your know, address. That is helpful to you if you want to leave because now you can go, okay, there's an employer over here. Let's get their address, my address, pop it in a map quest. How many, you know, how many miles is that? If it's over the, the 15 restriction, then now you know you have kind of a good certainty that that restriction um, doesn't apply to this employer over here. But when it's so big, um, sometimes it's difficult to know if you're going to violate your contract um, try, trying to get certain types of jobs. So it's very important to make sure um, the non-compete is clear, limited in scope. And sometimes, um, even if you're just out of med school, you don't have a lot of negotiating power, trying to get um, clear language, um, it, it's, sometimes that's a fair request. And some employers will modify the language some. So it's always nice still to at least try to request the language to be um, revise, even if you can't get exactly what you want early on in your career. That makes a lot of sense. And I think you bring up another good point, which is even, I, you could say even more important than the actual terms is understanding expectations and clarity. So if you go in and there's a terrible non-compete, but you know it and you can plan accordingly, that's very different than if you go in and you don't really think about it and then you try to leave. And then you find out maybe after you've already given notice, like, holy cow, I need to I need to like move three cities away to be able to continue to work. Yeah, it's very important before you sign the agreement, you really understand the implications of all the language. In some employment agreements, they're very complicated, lots of words. Um, you just gotta make sure you understand what those words mean and how it can impact your future. Um, and when you go into a relationship, usually it's a good one. Usually you're not going into a, an employment relationship thinking it's gonna be bad, um, but you really have to think of all the scenarios that could happen because, um, I mean, a, a contract really matters when the relationship goes south. So you really have to prepare for that in the future. And sometimes it's hard because you have a good relationship initially. So you're like, oh yeah, you know, I have a good relationship with this employer. I'm just gonna sign this, nothing will happen, but then something does happen. And so you really got to think about when you're signing the agreement, um, not how the relationship is now, but what, what are some of the worst case scenarios that can happen and how is that gonna impact me? Yeah, that's precisely the advice I give as a non-attorney. Like, think about all what we're doing is protecting against all of the possible worst case outcomes. So always look at your contract as if you're an adversarial party to the employer and like they're gonna try to take you for all your worth and you need to advocate for yourself. And in that scenario, what do you want the terms of the agreement to say? I'm curious, uh, 
in terms of the, the t testing the border of reasonability, what your experience has been? Have you worked with people who maybe challenged a non-compete that they thought was unreasonable and the court said, oh, no, this is fine or vice versa? And how have you seen that kind of play out? Really good question. So um, so in Indiana, um, Indiana generally doesn't necessarily favor non-competes but courts will enforce them if they're reasonable. So a court is really gonna dig into the facts of the case. So for example, a few years ago, we had a case, very interesting, it involved um, two uh, CRNAs. They worked for a medical service provider and that provider provided um, anesthesia services at a hospital. Well, they then left, went to work for another provider who then provided services at the hospital. In that case, the court actually determined that the, the employer in that case did not have a protectable business interest to, to enforce the non-compete. Um, and so there, but there were some really unique circumstances in that case. Um, one was that the, the first employer actually um, terminated its relationship with the hospital. And so courts often look at fairness, what's fair, what's reasonable. And so it wasn't really fair, okay, we're gonna terminate this relationship with the hospital VCRNAs leave and then another provider is going to provide services at, at that hospital saying, no, you can't provide services at, at that hospital um, when they when they terminated the relationship anyways. Um, also, this court, the, the Court of Appeals in this case, um, pointed out an interesting observation from the trial court that, that noted that patients in this case do not make a choice about medical care on the basis of a CRNA. And so that's an interesting point with certain types of um, healthcare workers and, and doctors, like a radiologist, an emer emergency room physician, an anesthesiologist. Um, a lot of times they might work with a patient once and then, and then not again. So the patient doesn't necessarily build that relationship with the doctor to then, if they leave, follow them. So if the patients aren't going aren't gonna to leave, then what is the protectable business interest? Is, you know, an inter interesting question that really um, needs to be answered. So what you're saying is precisely what we were describing before, that dynamic. The courts recognized that and said because of that, they found in favor of the, the employee who was trying to leave. Okay. Yeah. And there are cases where um, court has you know, found that a certain restriction is reasonable, like a three-county restriction or one-county restriction, one-year restriction, two-year restriction, um, especially if the doctor was involved with um, like re recruiting, building the business, uh, maybe an owner in the business, and the doctor could take business away. Um, of course, it's going to be more likely to enforce that. But if if it's a, uh, an employee who has nothing to do with the business, they if they leave, they're not going to take any business away. Um, a court may may not find that to be as reasonable as the first scenario. I think that's an important distinction, and I want to zoom in on it real quick. So the the partner of a business, an owner, a shareholder who has significant sway, maybe they're an anesthesiologist and, and they might be in some ways, oh, the anesthesiologist shouldn't be subject to an onerous non-compete. But if the value that they bring to the business isn't primarily through their actual clinical practice, but it's more from a strategic business decision, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that leadership type of role, then in that case, the, the facts of the case may be that uh, the the non-compete would be more, I guess, enforceable compared to yeah. somebody who's just an employee. Yep, absolutely. I think in in a lot of different states, um, if you have a, a business interest, uh, an ownership interest in the business, and then you leave or you sell the interest, I feel like the non-compete is going to be have a better chance of getting enforced. If you're just an employee, you have nothing. You're not taking any business away, and there's not a protectable business interest there. But where you have ownership and you're a leader. I think that you could do more damage to the business than just an employee. So yeah, I do think that courts um, do give weight and have given weight to owners of a business. My, argu my argument would be that should be built into other restrictive covenants. So that's not really your non-compete to, to practice anesthesia. Um, and so that, that's a big problem that I've had with a lot of these non-competes is, uh, you know, build that into a separate restrictive covenants. You can't go somewhere else and use this knowledge to build another business based on this knowledge, as opposed to you can't go across the street and practice anesthesia. So I totally agree. Can you elaborate on that, Brian? What other restrictive covenants are in play that could also be protective in this type of context? Oh, uh, well, I'll, I'll try and then I'll kick it to bar. But uh, 
cer- certainly there's confidentiality agreements. So, you know, you can't take any confidential information and use that uh, to either build your own business or harm the previous business. Um, there's solic- non-solicitation clauses, which is you can't leave and then try to take all of our employees with you. Um, Barb, I'll kick it to you. Those are the, those yeah, are three. So, big- so some states that don't like the non-compete, some of them, they will enforce the non-solicitation. So they're basically saying, okay, we're not going to limit you from like your job. Um, but you can't take our patients with you. You can't take our employees with you. And so I think courts are are um, a lot more likely to enforce those non-solicitation provisions, even in the states that don't like the non-competes. So the non-solicitation, the confidentiality, um, I think those provisions are going to be um, very likely to be upheld um, in a court than in some states that don't like the non-competes. I think that makes perfect sense. And I think it's, this is precisely, I guess, this is precisely what I'm saying, is that the non-solicit creates all of the protection that is needed in order yeah. to preserve the business interests of the owner. And so the non-compete, it just, it has no real utility, in my opinion, except to be kind of onerous for the employee who's just trying to get a job. That's my opinion. <laughs> and especially in, in healthcare, um, because doctors that have to leave the community, that affects the patients and the community, especially with with more um, specialized doctors, like a surgeon, you can't just go hire a surgeon off the street. I mean, it it could take a year to replace that surgeon. And so then how many um, surgeries have to get pushed back because that surgeon had to leave the state or leave the, the three county area. And so I do think with, you know, doctors, especially that affects the community. I think, I think one thing to bring up, and this is, uh, this is sort of applicable to, to Barb and I in Indiana. Um, as of July 1st, I can't remember if it's 19 or 20. Uh, 2020, yep, 20, last 2020, year. The, uh, the state of Indiana now requires physician non-competes to include some sort of reasonable way to purchase your way out of a non-compete. Um, and so I think that's a, I think it's a step in the right direction. I, I mean, I don't think it goes far enough, but I think it's a step in the right direction to allow physicians to say, okay, I signed this non-compete um, and, and maybe I shouldn't have signed this non-compete, but at least there's a financial way to get out of this non-compete and go on with my life. And so um, I think there are a few states that do that and I, I can't remember which ones, but- uh, Would that was, be was, liquidated damages? Is that what that's called? Or one of the mechanisms um, by which that's achieved? So yes, yeah, so Indiana law requires, there are several components now that has to be in a physician non-compete agreement for it to be valid after July 1st, 2020. Um, and one is when Brian's talking about it is it says there has to be a provision providing the physician an option to purchase a release from the terms of the enforceable physician non-compete agreement at a reasonable price. Um, so sometimes it's called a buyout. The, the issue is reasonable price is not defined. And so what does that mean? To an employer, maybe that means a million dollars is reasonable, but to the employee, maybe that's $50,000. So a practice pointer is um, for a physician's negotiating these non-competes, um, ask, you know, define what reasonable price means in your contract. If you can get a number worked out in advance, then now you know what it's going to cost to buy out of your non-compete. If you just go with the reasonable price language, then once you go to try to, to leave your employment, you're going to be surprised with this number that we don't know what an Indian court is going to consider to be reasonable. So another practice pointer, just try to negotiate that to get that to be as, as as clear as possible so you know what you're getting yourself into. But I agree with Brian. I think that we are headed in in a a right direction with this in Indiana. And I would say furthermore on the negotiating side, you can negotiate it from both ends. So if you know where you're going to land and you know what the out clause says, if it's a $50,000 buyout, say, hey, practice XYZ, I'd love to come work for you, but it's going to cost me $50,000 to extract myself from my current arrangement. Maybe you can help me out here. Yep, exactly. That happens. You know what it's going to be. That happens a lot. Uh, That happens a lot. Yeah. 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 But if it's a million dollars, well, then that's, that's not always reasonable for, for some physicians, especially like newer doctors, right. You know, a few years out of med school. And hopefully a court would agree. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get some case law on that. at some point. I'm I'm sure it's going to get adjudicated fairly quickly. Uh, I know a lot of the private practice groups were really struggling with this. Uh, at least in Indiana. So I, I think, uh, I, I imagine it'll take probably three to five years and we'll get some some more clarity on what that number is going to end up being. Can you talk a little bit, Barb, about the difference between uh, case law and statutory law and sort of how those ideas interact? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the statutory law, that's going to be a law passed by the state legislator. So that's going to be our codified law. So we can go to that, look at that, read the provisions, and then we kind of know what it says to try to um, rely on that law and um, kind of predict, you know, whether a non-compete is going to be enforceable or not, if it's in compliance with the law or if it's not in compliance with the law. Case law is going to be law that is um, reviewed by a court. And so a judge is going to hear a case, both sides of the story, and the judge is going to render a ruling. Um, in, in India, we have the trial court level, the court will, will issue a ruling, and then that can ap appeal to the appellate court level at the Indiana Court of Appeals, um, which is the case I had referred to earlier, that was the Indiana Court of Appeals case. They're going to uh, issue an opinion, um, which then becomes law that is binding in the, the entire state. Um, and then in Indiana, you can appeal it to the Supreme Court level. Um, and then there's there's state court and there's federal courts. So there's different different types of court systems that issue case law opinions. So if I'm a uh, you know an employee trying to extract myself from what I deem to be an onerous non-compete, how should I think of you know if I say oh there's precedent at, at the appellate court level, the 25 mile radius from one site was deemed to be unreasonable and it was shrank to 15. Is it is it appropriate? Can I look at that and say, I think that this is worth appealing or worth getting counsel because there's a job 17 miles away that I really want. And it's, it's sort of in that range. Is that a way to think about it? Or how would you counsel someone to yeah. think about that? Yeah. So before you make a move like that, I have doctors come to me all the time um, saying, Hey, I work here. I, here's my agreement. I have this restriction. I want to work here. Can you look at my agreement and tell me if this is outside of my non-compete? Is this going to get me into trouble? So what I do is I look at the specific language of the agreement, the not compete, and then I break it all down and analyze it. All the different com the components, the duration, the geography, the extent. Is there a protectable business interest here? What is the definition of competitor? Um, usually they'll say um, the scope of activities. So if you were practicing as a, um, a surgeon, general surgery here, then you can't go practice general surgery for a competitor. Um, or sometimes it's even broader than that. So take a look at all of that. Then what I do is I look at the Indiana case law. And sometimes you can find it, might be able to find a case with similar facts to yours. And then you can see how a court looked at that non-compete and how it ruled. And so if you can find that, then you can say, okay, we have precedent here. And so my case is like this case over here where the court determined that the non-compete was invalid. Um, if you, But sometimes you don't have that, that's not out there. Um, and so then sometimes you have to make a, a good faith kind of argument and guess of how that would go. And then there's there's some risk there. You think, okay, this not compete, it's um, overly broad in duration, overly broad in um, geographic scope. There's not a lot of legitimate business interest. Okay, I don't think that this non compete is valid. If we go to court, I think I might win. But there's a risk that you could lose. Um, so you have to kind of balance that risk when you're trying to determine, okay, if I leave, um, am I gonna get in trouble here? Is it a viol I mean, am I violating this contract? I think no. But my employer might think yes. And so you just have to kind of balance that, do a cost benefit analysis, and then kind of decide, okay, what's my appetite for risk here? Do I want to take this risk or do I not? So Makes sense. So if I am a physician interested in trying to get out of a non-compete, can you give us a sense in terms of like working with an attorney to get a qualified opinion on this stuff? Like what does it cost us to say, here's what I think and here's what I think we should do versus if we go to trial, here's what it'll look like? Yeah, really good question. So um, often attorneys for contract review will charge an hourly rate. Um, so, I mean, in Indiana, that, you know, might be cheaper than California. So it might be like, you know, two or $300 or two to three fifty or whatever um, for, you know, three to five to 10 hours of ana analysis, depending on the complexity of the agreements, how many agreements there are, are you an owner? Is it just an employment agreement? And then are you looking at another employment agreement? Um, whereas if you go to court um, and litigate, I mean, that could be many thousands in attorney's fees. That could be 50,000 in attorney's fees. Um, and then depending on your agreement, depending on what it says, um, you could be responsible if you lose for the other side's attorney's fees. So you really got to pay close attention to that issue in your contract when you're considering, do I want to um, chance this and fight this in court? Because you could be on the hook for double attorney's fees. So that 50,000 attorney's fees could turn into 100,000 attorney's fees. So you really have to assess all of that very carefully um, when you're deciding what, what your next move is going to be. From my point of view, from a pack, practical point of view, what I would say is get an attorney to look at your agreement. 
figure out where you stand. If you think you've got a halfway decent case and you think that your employer is somewhat reasonable, go to the employer and say, listen, I don't think this is fully uh, enforceable. Um, let's work something out. I mean, that's, that's, and that's not legal advice. That's just my own mm-hmm. practical business advice. Uh, to try to try to get it figured out, try to get it settled without having to get, get into court or into lawsuits or anything like that. So. Yep. And some employers will, will take, you know, that and your honesty and your sincerity, and some of them will work with you to get out, you know, let you out of the non-compete, or maybe they decide that um, where you're going, it's outside of their non-compete or it's not a competitor. So um so sometimes that approach does work. Sometimes you have to be careful though, because if you go and and um, say that you want to leave, then that can make your um, employment difficult. So you just got to kind of really assess your work environment, assess the contract, and just kind of consider everything, all the factors. Totally, and I think this just it warrants repeating at this point that so much of the uh, so much of the controllables is just clarity in expectation and in terminology. Because if it's very clearly outlined, even if you think it's unreasonable, at least you're going to know, well, is it 25 miles from here or from the, this cluster of sites? Or, And then you'll at least have a little bit more information to say, is it worth paying a lawyer 2 to 4K to look at this contract to tell me if I should then continue to raise the stakes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brian, from your standpoint, are there any other sort of... Uh, you know, if, if a doc comes to you and is asking advice, any other practical considerations or as we take these legal principles and apply them to the real world of the practice of anesthesia, anything else that you think is uh, worth keeping in mind? Yeah, I mean, I would just I would just be sure that when you sign that non-compete, you know what your next step is going to be. I, you and I talk about this all the time, um, you know, always being one step ahead, know, know what you're going to do next. Uh, so if you know that your next step is going to be a place that's 10 miles away and your non-compete has a 20 mile radius, you know, maybe that's not the right job. Um, or, or maybe you talk to them and say, Hey, let's make it a 10 mile non-compete East and not West. Um, you know, where I am in Northern Indiana, um, I'm, you know, a couple miles from the Michigan border. So maybe for me, if I say, Hey, you know, my ultimate dream job is in Michigan, just across the border. Hey, I'll sign a non-compete for, 10 miles within the state of Indiana. So, but then I can still go, go up to Michigan. So I think you just got to be a little bit creative with it and know what your next step is, know what your next step is going to be. Absolutely. Yep. And some employers will um, work with you and they might carve out some limited exceptions just for you. Um, Sometimes you won't know though, unless you ask. Uh, As we wrap up here, uh, Barb, is there anything else that we haven't covered or other key concepts or considerations that are worth keeping in mind? Um, yeah, so just some final um, practice pointers, of course, before you sign any agreement, just in, in life in general, make sure you review it carefully. And of course, my advice is to have it reviewed by an experienced contract attorney, because some of the language can just get very tricky. And you just want to be really, really careful um, for non-competes. Try negotiating the non-compete as narrowly as possible before signing. You know, for the duration, if they're giving you a three-year, you know, maybe try to negotiate that down to a one-year. If it's a three-county restriction, maybe you can try to negotiate that down to a one-county restriction. Um, if if there's a your state requires a buyout, you know, what is reasonable? Maybe you can come up with a number. Just try to negotiate that contract as best as possible to make it as clear as possible, so that if you do leave, then you have options. Makes perfect sense. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, Dr. Brian Schmutzler, Barb Malarjic fitch it's been a pleasure speaking with both of you today. I really appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks for joining us on APM Success. Thanks for having us. Thanks. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.